Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society and family life. We hear now from Professor Martin Kiedel about pacifism during the First World War. I'm Martin Kiedel. I'm a retired professor of politics from the University of Oxford, and I've spent much of my career working on the peace movement with particular reference to Britain. Historians must use their detached perspective to identify patterns which have become apparent with hindsight. Yet they must also recognise that contemporaries will often have been unaware of those patterns at the time. Now, with hindsight, I can detect, I think, an interesting pattern in the use of pacifism during the First World War. The word had been coined as recently as 1901 and was used then in three senses. Two of them were related to the peace movement. The first was the absolute refusal to use armed force in any circumstances, most famously demonstrated by conscientious objectors. That's the sense in which the word pacifism is now mostly used, especially in the English-speaking world. The second is a belief that war can be abolished, for example, by creating a League of Nations, though in a last resort, armed force may still be needed, for example, in the form of military sanctions through the League against an aggressor. This sense is now often referred to by historians as pacificism because it is pacific, but not pacifist in the absolute sense. The third sense in which it was used was simply war weariness or defeatism, unrelated to any peace movement-based belief that armed force can immediately be renounced or that international relations can be reformed. This sense is simply anti-war. The pattern is that in the First World War UK, pacifism and pacificism were by comparative standards particularly strong. Yet, outside Ireland, where republicanism and nationalism had by 1916 made the imposition of conscription there impossible, anti-war feeling was, by comparative standards, particularly weak. So we have a paradox. Where pacifism in the two peace movement senses was strongest, as in the UK, support for the war effort was best sustained. Now, there is a resolution to the paradox namely that peace movements were an attribute of liberal modernity, but so too were the political authority, administrative efficiency, economic resilience, and social cohesion needed for a war of attrition. A modern liberal state like the UK, minus Ireland, traded off the risk of tolerating dissent, of allowing a peace movement to operate freely, and recognising conscientious objection against the gain in political legitimacy of doing so. Now, my belief is that during 1914 to 18, this trade-off worked in the UK's favour, but this could not have been guaranteed in advance. Now, the government couldn't ever ignore the peace movement. In particular, in July 1914, it couldn't warn Germany that the UK was going to stand by France because of the strength of radical pacificism within the governing Liberal Party. And the government would have faced even bigger problems had Germany avoided crushing Belgium on the 4th of August 1914. Also, if the Germans had made a credible peace offer during particularly 1917-18, to if they'd offered the status quo before the war, then I think the government would have found it difficult to dampen down requests for a negotiated peace. Also, I think, if the Germans had been able to sustain the war into 1919, after one more winter, that would have caused problems for the government. But as it was, the government was able to make uniquely generous provision for conscientious objection in deference to the country's pacifist minority, and yet find that this was probably beneficial to the war effort because it canalised opposition to the war into constitutional channels. Conscientious objectors, for the most part, went through the procedures. They didn't just dodge the draft. The peace association that the government found most problematical was an organisation called the Union of Democratic Control, 
which eventually called for a negotiated peace. But interestingly, their influence was offset by another strand of pacificists, liberals loyal to Asquith and Gray, who'd supported the war from the outset, but took seriously the obligation to make it a war that would end war. And to that end, they devised and promoted the idea of a League of Nations in an implementable form, a plausible form that a government could operate, which first the British Foreign Secretary Gray, then the American President Wilson, and then finally assorted Europeans could espouse for their own purposes. So in a sense, peace activists were pulling in different directions. The absolute pacifists and conscientious objectors and the radical pacificists of the Union of Democratic Control were stirring up anti-war sentiment that worried the government in late 1917 and early 1918. But the liberal pacificists of the League of Nations movement were providing a motive that drew the United States eventually into the war, promotion of a League of Nations, and were providing British public opinion with an idealistic reason to hold out for victory, namely being able to have a peace settlement in which a League of Nations was created. So as a historian with hindsight, I think I can see a rather paradoxical pattern that having a strong peace movement contributed to the legitimacy of the war effort and helped the government sustain it, though this is partly because the Germans didn't behave as smartly as perhaps they might have done. But historians must recognise that it's often imposing a pattern that was not detectable at the time. And an example of a prominent individual who didn't see some of these distinctions is the extraordinary pacificist campaigner Norman Angel. Angel was famous as the author of a book published in 1910 called The Great Illusion. Now, that illusion was that a major power could improve its economic position by aggression. Angel saw the Germans were building a fleet, and he argued that even if the German fleet was powerful enough to sail up the Thames, take all the gold out of the Bank of England, it would lose more from the disruption to an interdependent world economic system than it would gain from the bullion it had grabbed. And he says that the international economy would collapse like a house of cards, and Germany would lose a thousand times more than any gains through confiscating gold. Angel became famous because of this thesis, but when the First World War broke out, he was horrified at the fact that Britain was proposing to intervene, and he becomes the most active neutrality campaigner in that short period between the outbreak of the war in Europe when Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia and Britain's intervention. But the Neutrality League failed. Thereafter, Angel was involved in founding the Union of Democratic Control, which was in many ways an extension of the neutrality movement. Now, initially, he believed that the public was in favour of the Union of Democratic Control's beliefs. And in fact, his letters around the time that the UDC became public are extraordinarily optimistic. He writes to an American friend predicting that scores of millions in England shared the UDC's views. And he told a private dinner of his American followers in London that the British authorities were petrified of popular discontent. Quote, machine guns lie prepared for action in the cellars of Buckingham Palace. Yet he soon discovered that he got it completely wrong. Even his former supporters repudiated him and the demand for his services, he lived as a speaker and an author, fell off so dramatically that he took himself off to the United States. On his arrival in the United States, he writes a controversial article pointing out that the United States as a neutral trader was suffering from the fact that the law of war then allowed the Royal Navy to stop neutral shipping as part of a blockade of Germany. He points out that this is contrary to American interests. And actually, it would be in America's interests to join the war in order to have a say in a final peace settlement, which would reform the laws of war and create a League of Nations. 
So astonishingly, Angel, who in Britain was regarded as a neutralist pariah, finds himself advocating American intervention. And his ideas are taken up by Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, in the famous speech in which he committed himself to a League of Nations, actually quoted Angel's own words. So Angel, a neutralist pariah regarded as hostile to the government in Britain, is a liberal internationalist interventionist with friends in high places in the United States. So Angel is not seeing any distinction between the views of the UDC, which are basically neutralist, and the views of the League of Nations movement, which are basically interventionist. He gets even more surprisingly eclectic in his views. He comes back to Britain in 1916 when conscription is introduced, and it seems that because his reputation had been so boosted in left-wing circles by the fact he had been the most effective neutrality campaigner, he sees himself as a possible future leader of the British left, and that career would be boosted if he took a pacifist position. So he comes back almost certainly with the intention of declaring himself a conscientious objector. He finds, however, that he is over the age for conscription, which leaves him in a slightly odd situation. But while he's waiting for a passport to get back to the United States, he converts to socialism and he finds himself in this extraordinary position of campaigning for logically very different positions, campaigning for the independent Labour Party, preaching an almost revolutionary doctrine that conscription is part of a capitalist conspiracy for permanently enslaving the British working class. Within days of a revolutionary meeting in South Wales, he's attending a respectable Chelsea drawing room for a very genteel meeting in favour of the League of Nations movement. He finally gets permission to go back to the United States for a second time, and there he's in a quite remarkable position. He advertises his services to the American public information officials and says, I can talk to the left and persuade them that their ideals, like a League of Nations, will be best served by supporting the war effort and dropping their radical campaigning. But he then says, and I can also, of course, speak to the hardline supporters of the war, that their cause will be best served by accepting that if they add a commitment to a League of Nations, this will pull the left more towards them on idealistic grounds. Angel, as a contemporary, quick-witted observer, is actually managing to ride several horses at once. One of the striking things about the way the First World War is now remembered is that there is a widespread belief that British conscientious objectors were very badly treated. But if you look at the historical record, only three other conscripting combatants made any provision for conscientious objection. That was the United States, Canada, and New Zealand. And they only exempted members of historic peace churches. And of course, that greatly simplified things because it was a matter of factual record whether you were a member of a particular sect or not. Also, those countries only exempted people from combatant service, so they could be inducted into the army for non-arms-bearing roles. Now, in the United States, even those members of recognised historic peace sects who brought into the army, they're put under such pressure that four-fifths of them abandon their stand. In Britain, nothing like that happened at all. Britain not only allowed conscientious objection to be claimed by members of historic peace sects, it allowed atheists to do so. Its conception of conscience was extremely broad. And of course, that posed real problems for assessing conscience, because it wasn't just a matter of proving your membership of a particular sect or church. The other thing is that Britain, albeit only after a period of confusion, allowed alternative service. You didn't have to go into the army, you didn't have to be under military authority. You could do work of national importance under civilian control. And in principle, some people, although it was always intended only for the exceptional, were exempted altogether. They didn't have to do anything else. There were grievances in Britain, 
people who had their conscience claim completely rejected by their tribunal, they then get brought into the army. And some of those did go through some difficult periods. But eventually, the government sorted the situation out so that they went to civilian prisons. And in fact, the death rate for conscientious objectors was below the prisoner average. The government was faced with the fact that The No Conscription Fellowship, which was the leading socialist objector organisation, and the Friends Peace Committee, which was a body created by the Quakers, both urged conscientious objectors not to accept alternative service, but to hold out for complete exemption. They did so in the belief that this would wreck the conscription system, but it didn't. There were perhaps 20,000 conscientious objectors in all, and there were perhaps 1,400 who held out for the absolutist position and were prepared to go to jail rather than do alternative service. But this was a much more favourable outcome, say, than the outcome for American pacifists. The conventional view is that the conscientious objectors were badly treated, which, from a comparative point of view, is not the right emphasis. As a historian, I believe that I've detected an interesting pattern in the different senses of pacifism in the First World War, that the two peace movement-related ones actually helped reduce the anti-war sentiment and sustain support for the war effort. I'm aware that my schematization, pacifism in the absolute conscientious objector sense, pacificism in the abolishing war through the League of Nations sense, And simple defeatism or war weariness was not something that activists at the time would have recognised. Norman Angel was a classic case of somebody who could ignore intellectual distinctions, which after the event do seem very important. What still strikes me most about the way the First World War is popularly represented is the idea that somehow the British state was harsh on conscientious objectors, whereas by comparative standards, it was way ahead of its time in generosity. That was Professor Martin Keedle on pacifism. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Louise Jackson about crime rates and policing during the First World War.